you're live okay I'm live this is kind of a grainy picture and uh, this is our first go around on this so this is the first time I've seen this screen and I don't see anybody else here not that I can recollect so if anybody else is here can you Okay, go ahead. Chime in. So I'll know to start the the live chat. <clears throat> I don't see anything, Jill. Okay. Oh, quit. Um, I look great though, that's for sure. What do you want? Um, uh, the TV. Oh, for watching, watching it the... says. Okay, play. Go ahead and talk to him. All right. Uh, <laughs> good thing I didn't say anything bad. Are you guys there? Because uh, Jill's telling me on the phone that you are. She's looking at her phone. I don't see any thing. Any chats or anything, huh? I wonder why the picture is so poor. It says end stream there. You know, I might be on. It says live. Is there any way we could know? Um, oh, it's Lorna says you're live, so go ahead and talk. All right. Somebody called on the phone and said I'm live. <clears throat> oh, she's moving everyone over. All right. Well, go ahead. our production manager is moving everybody over to this page I guess I'm not sure how that works <clears throat> so if you all can hear me I might as well start we're three minutes and 40 seconds into it and it looks like we have 10 people so that's really cool um, hopefully there'll be a way that you can put some uh, questions in there but if not, I can definitely fill an hour with uh, with my yak. But let me let me start off. And this is, you know, this is all impromptu because this is just our life. And so, question and answer is very easy. But I thought to start this off, there's got to be 11 people there that don't know me. Start off by <clears throat> giving you a brief. Uh, Okay, I got a phone call coming in, though. No, go ahead and talk. I got it. Okay. I'll give you a brief uh, synopsis of who I am and what I'm doing and how I got to this point where I feel like I want to take question and questions and answers about uh, homesteading. All right. I, uh, I went in the Air Force when I was 24, and I got out when I was 44, so I did a, a full 20 years 
Uh, I was in the maintenance career field most of the time, uh, aviation, and uh, I did a lot of things on the side. I was um, always been interested in doing things. Um, in about 97, or no, it would have been about 96, my wife and I moved to a small farm. And uh, at the time, I was deploying every week for a few days out to what they call the missile field. And so I'd be gone for a few days, and then I'd come in. And then we, uh, we moved to this really small farm. It was 13 acres, and it's a small house, and uh, it was just so we could keep her horse there. That's why we did that. <clears throat> we had previously lived in town. And when I would come in from the field, I'd, had, I'd have a couple days off. And so I started wanting to do things uh, like garden and uh, raise some chickens for eggs. And, and it was um, more or less for a hobby and just to keep a little sanity. And uh, I found myself wanting more and more to get into the things that I was doing, like raising chickens and uh, I finally moved up. To, I got some pigs, and uh, by the time we left that farm, I actually had some beef cows. And I did a little bit of fencing on the place, not near as much as I should have. And I guess I knew more than the average bear, but I didn't know much. And I did know that when I came in from the missile field, I took great solace in um, milking a goat. You know, it just gave me a great feeling. So then I got to the end of my career and I had to pick something that I wanted to do. And I thought, I want to be a farmer because that's what I thought I was doing. So I came here to Michigan, bought an 80 acre farm and then delved into commercial farming, which I didn't know anything about. And I just thought I could, I could figure it out. And um, we did that for 14 years. We had ups and downs and <clears throat> the joy of of farming uh, wasn't always there because it became a uh, numbers game because uh, commercial farming, everything that you produce, you're converting into dollars and then you use those dollars to get the things you need to sustain your lifestyle. <clears throat> so if you have you know like several calves that die, um, you bear that. If you have a whole bunch of chickens that die, you bear that, you know. And so the the rough things that happen, uh, it falls directly on you. And then you find out that you're in competition with people who have been doing it a long time. With, and, and there's several different groups, but the ones that, that stick out is, say, like industrial agriculture that can produce... Uh, let's say livestock um, and produce actually <laughs> for far less than I can do it because they're far more efficient. Um, but their efficiency comes from methods that maybe don't lead to a healthy product. All right. So, but we still have to compete in the same marketplace with them. So it, it's a lot tougher than you would think. You know, if I have to get $4 a pound for a chicken and they can get, 29 cents a pound for a chicken and they can still make their margin it's a it's a tough sell um although we did okay um and we we stayed in the black for the most part um as soon as we started running some trouble with some regulators and things like this about you know the department of ag and things like that it got to the point where we found that we weren't enjoying it as much as we should have and uh, you know we wanted to quit uh, we just never did you know a lot of times we thought we would quit but we just never got around to quitting so when we first started this back at our first farm basically what we were doing is homesteading we were growing uh, livestock and produce and they were for our use only and if you get a little baby pig that you pay $15 for and then you raise it up to a, a 400 pound pig and you do that by feeding it scraps and just junk food and 
you know, whatever you can lay your hands on, you put in your freezer a lot of sustenance for very little money. So there's very little slippage there and you do very well for your family. If I had to sell that pig, I'm selling it in a market where pig meat is probably, you know, 69 cents a pound or whatever it is. So then we would lose, you know. So what we decided to do was to go back into the homesteading model and just produce for our family and a group of friends. And all of a sudden, things started to click. We started to enjoy it more because there was adventure. There was more discovery. We weren't doing a lot of one thing or a lot of two things. We were able to spread out and, uh, you know, discover new things or try things that we wanted to try for a while. And so if you'd asked me when we were in commercial farming, what do you do? I'd say I raise pigs and I raise chickens, poultry. And we raised a lot of chickens and a lot of pigs. And we would spend a lot of time butchering chickens, a lot of time running pigs to a USDA plant to have them slaughtered and then trying to distribute that out. So we ran a lot of freezer units and that equals a lot of electricity and, uh, it was go, go, go. When summertime hit, you know, and you want to go swimming, you can't go swimming. You want to go fishing, you can't go fishing because you have to make these units pay. And uh, that's just the way it is. Now, I'm fortunate that I have a military retirement and we live pretty close to the ground. I mean, we, um, we enjoy just being together and being on our farm. Most of the time, most of the time. Um, and so we don't have a whole lot of expenses like that. So it works out for us to homestead. Our, uh, okay, our, uh, what's going to happen here, just for your information, my wife is going to be the moderator. So she's writing down the questions that she thinks that I should answer, and I'm going to do that. So she's handing those to me. But let me finish my, my spiel here. So, um, Okay, we went, in, we went back to homesteading and we started to discover that we liked being around each other as a family because we, we want to discover what it takes to raise bees. We want to discover what it takes to do mushrooms and making sausage and hanging hams and butchering cattle, which we haven't really had much of a chance to do because we've been so busy. And raising calves, uh, doing more... Um, pasturing of our animals than we did in the in the past being able to bring our facilities up being able to fix the house up so it's more comfortable so it's all it's all worked out pretty well we have a different direction than the commercial farming deal and i'm liking it a whole lot more it seems like the people around me are liking it a whole lot more which is important and we go to go into that in the homesteading model is uh family friendly farming which is very important okay so i wrote down this is my my big preparation right here i wrote down what it is that i do and i wrote it that what it is that i do okay i lead a family that's the number one thing i am the leader of this outfit so um basically what that means is the responsibility falls on me if something goes wrong here, ultimately, it is my fault. I like to train my, my um, children to oversee the functions that we do so that we don't wind up with burned down buildings, broken water pipes, lost tools, just basics. And the farm provides me with an excellent training tool for my kids. Right now in the house, I have my youngest child is seven and then my oldest child that's home is is 15 and then we have a few that are around my wife and i have eight children <clears throat> okay okay i maintain a farm so i'm the the head um maintainer around here if a tree goes down i got to take care of it if we have an electrical problem i got to take care of it or i have to find somebody that can so one of the things that we talk about in homesteading is do you know how everything on your farm works? And that's quite a subject right there because you can, you can fix that by getting rid of the stuff you don't know how it works 
or getting your or work the other end of it and getting smart about how stuff works because unless we you know dig into a toaster we are never going to know how that works so we we preach that you know getting to know your equipment and i not that a toaster isn't a piece of equipment or anything but that you would use in homesteading but it kind of is okay i cut hay we have about 50 acres of what they call hay ground and so i take one or two cuttings of hay off of that and because of that um i choose not to sell that hay so that hay goes in my clear span building and then i choose to feed that hay to us you know a number of beef cattle and that's what i chose to choose to do and there's a lot that goes with that um, i milk two cows just two and i don't milk them at the same time i i'm trying to rotate them so i will have one cow in milk and one in waiting and the calves that come from them those are the calves that we're going to raise up for beef unless we want to do something else with them you know and that's a that's a deep subject too okay I run a butcher shop, so we built uh, a building on our farm, and we outfit it like a butcher shop. One time, I had a license from the Department of Agriculture to uh, operate it as a food service facility, and that was a license that I had to buy. And without that license, and we want to talk about this at some point, um, I can't sell any of my produce to retail stores restaurants or farmers markets so you would say oh well, where can you sell it we'll get into that okay um we grow a garden we have a pretty good sized garden actually several of them and uh we we all uh pitch in on that and it provides us with a real good share of the produce that we need uh for the year we raise pigs. The type of pigs that I raise are Mangalitsa. They're a heritage breed that comes out of Hungary. And we've been doing that for since uh, 2010. So we've figured that out pretty good. We butcher most of them here on the farm. And uh, then we've gotten into specialty ways of uh, what's called charcuterie, where you can prepare that meat for... Uh, long-term storage you know dried sausages things like that and it's really fun um there's a lot of information out there about it um we we do help people learn how to do that we do classes on that we raise beef cows and steers i have two um uh, let's see i have about four beef cows right now and i don't know uh several steers i'm not sure how many exactly i would say under 10 right now and we'll get them as calves and raise them up. They're a place that we can dispose our hay. They will eat it and they will turn hay into beef. Um, you can just sell the hay and then you'll get less money for it. Okay, well, I'm getting, I'm racking up the questions here. So I'm gonna finish with my little bio here. Uh, we raise chickens. We raise meat chickens and egg chickens. Uh, we have about 50 egg chickens. It's more of a, an exercise for my kids, but my family goes through quite a few uh, eggs every day. And I eat three or four eggs every every morning for breakfast. And, uh, you know, we use a lot of eggs. And eggs, that's a deep subject, too. I mean, there's a lot to talk about there, because when you have 50 chickens, all of a sudden you get a glut of eggs in the spring. And what do you do with them? You know, I sometimes suggest throwing them at cars going by but really what do you do with them you wind up giving them away for a buck a dozen and you devalue them so we've uh, discovered a way just recently how to save eggs for up to two years which is really cool love to talk about that sometime um, we do meat chickens um, pastured poultry I highly recommend doing pastured poultry um, and then there's all kinds of facets that go with that you have to get them as little chicks you have to brood them. You have to have um, chicken tractors to put them in. And then in eight weeks, you've got a really nice chicken that's been eating the grass that you have it on. It's been eating clover and nice alfalfa. You, you have to give them some feed, too. 
and those chickens are so superior to the chickens that you can get at the store it's unbelievable all right but we do a lot of that at one time we had 30 chicken tractors now we only have two and i'm going to be building some new ones this spring i'd like to do a, a how to uh, video on that um okay we make a lot of compost because i have these cows so i get okay i'm being told to move along uh, so we get a lot of manure. You have to do something with the manure. So we also preach taking a liability and turning it into an asset. And you can do that with almost anything. And then uh, we grow mushrooms too. And as far as honey goes, I have a friend that brings his bees over and uh, uh, live at my place in the summertime. And we get we do a little swapping and I get some honey out of that. Plus we get the, the, the joy of having the bees on the farm, which is really nice. Okay. Uh, okay. If you would, please ask questions on the chat in capitals, in capitals. Okay. Okay. First question. What is needed to start for someone into it? What is needed to start for someone who's just getting? Oh, good, good question. My assistant's right here helping me. Um, I would say the first thing that you need is a plan. All right, decide what you want to do. Uh, and that's the beauty of this chat, really. I could be in there watching MacGyver with the kids, but we're able to, to be here and we got people from all over. I mean, we got a massive number of people on this chat right now. People from all over. Um, <clears throat> and this is when the magic happens, when we can, in, when we can get into conversations about this so say the first thing that you need is to develop a plan and <clears throat> hey could you ask one of those people to do something about those barking dogs because <clears throat> i don't want to disturb the chat here uh and if if i were to come out to your place the first thing i would look at is what do you have for, for facilities what do you have to work with now, homesteaders, do you have to have an 80-acre farm? <clears throat> the answer is absolutely not. Matter of fact, with an 80-acre farm, I've saddled myself with a lot more responsibility than, let's say, I had five acres. I can still do a ton on five acres. It's unbelievable what you can do if you learn how to stack processes up. Okay, so the plan is probably the most important thing. Um, decide what you want to do and why you want to do it. And this isn't something that you should take lightly. Lightly, You should think about it. What is your schedule? Um, in homesteading, I am not advocating for you to quit your day job. I think you should keep your day job. I think you should look at homesteading as, you know, as uh, a function that will maybe take the place of watching MacGyver on Netflix, all right? Do away with that and do something productive. Figure out what you can do to increase your sustainability as a human being, right? Uh, right now, it seems like we have turned over every bit of the responsibility of our lives to somebody else, you know? Where's your food come from? I don't know. The store, I guess. I don't know. So let's start taking responsibility for the things that we need. It's actually a lot of fun. I, I, I don't think anybody's here that's going to say, well, I don't want to do this because it's too much work. That's like saying going bass fishing is too much work or going turkey hunting is too much work or going bowling is too much work. If it's what you want to do, it won't be work at all. And I, I think that let's say you have a day job, maybe that's a pain to you. But you can come home and you can be on your homestead. You can tend your chickens. You can uh, look after your, your garden in the summer. You can 
can your vegetables before fall. You can um, butcher your own deer. All these things that are homesteading functions. And instead of them costing you money, you're actually making money on them. Okay. So I hope that helps you there. Uh, that was Dave that asked that. If you, um, this is a, if you post your question and you tell us where you're from, then I will uh, mention that because we would love to know where people are from. So, Dave, if you can let us know where you're from. Oh, it's Dave and Amanda. I bet you I know who these people are. Okay. Do, do Tyler's question. Okay. This is uh, another question from Tyler Fenton. And the question is, do I feed any grain to my pigs? The answer to that <clears throat> is, yes, I do. Um, pigs are omnivores. Uh, you, can, you can feed a pig anything from a roadkill deer to junk uh, birthday cakes, and they will eat it all. The question is, is that pig is going to convert that into usable meat and fat for you to eat? So you have to decide what is it that you want to be eating. If you want to uh, feed your pigs maggoty deer, dead deer, then that's pretty much what you're going to think about when you're eating a pork chop, I think. So I would be a little careful with that. Um, I, myself, have a junk bread contract with a company, and... Uh, they bring me oh, 10 yards of, of pretty nice bread, actually, uh, every week, and I feed that to my pigs. I also feed them um, hay that I cut off my place. Pigs do eat hay. And then in the summertime, I grow fields for my pigs. Just I have certain fields that I have pigs on. They A pig will take everything off that field um, if you are entertaining the the thought of grazing a pig on a field, forget it. Uh, they will, they won't graze it. They'll dig it. And but you can turn a, a hay field into a pig field pretty quick. They'll eat every blade of grass off there and and turn it all into pork. And then you can plant it with minimal equipment uh, in quite a few things that'll grow a lot of forage for the pigs. But yeah, I do feed. I do feed grain. Um, the type of pigs that I have and what I'm looking for, I don't feed any corn because uh, the Mangalitsa pig has a bright white fat, and that fat is used for everything from greasing my shotgun down to uh, shortening that goes in biscuits around here. It's really nice stuff. You cannot beat the Mangalitsa pig for a homestead animal. They'll eat anything, turn it into really high quality meat and, and fat. So I'm a little bit picky what I'll feed to them. I've even taken trips out to the coast and brought back seaweed with me and fed, them, fed that to them. I don't have a problem with them eating seaweed because it's highly mineralized. And Okay, let me move on. I'm getting the look over here. Um, that was Tyler from north central ohio okay what i should have is like a map right here with all the the pins on there of people all across the united states see what we're doing we're coming together as a powerful homesteading lobby here okay next question what is the key to creating a family friendly homestead the key I'd say the key is, as the leader, try to figure out what would make everybody, what would make each individual member of your team, what turns them on. And then when you give out jobs, make sure that it it's not always drudgery. But with my kids, I like them to see the full spectrum of work sometimes it's drudgery and you just got to do it you just got to get it done but then there's the discovery end of it for some people they like the the discovering of new things so 
I I dream up things for them to do that I know are going to involve. You know, I've got young boys uh, breaking ice. Um, you know, let's say we have a bunch of pumpkins out there that the pigs just can't get into them because they're too hard. I can have them go out there with baseball bats and break them. They love that. Um, uh, powered equipment when it comes to boys is key. Uh, we have an old snowmobile that has a trailer behind it. And if they can go out to feed the pigs with the snowmobile, oh, they're all about that because then they drive past the pen and see how much stuff they can throw in. It's it's drive-by feeding. Uh, they love that. And, you know, I'm wanting them to build their skills, their agility and all that stuff. I like them using equipment. So it works for me as well. Another thing we have is a, an old lawnmower that doesn't have a mower deck on it anymore. And, you know, the engine works fine, starts up. And we have a little trailer that goes with that. Well, if I need firewood brought to the house, I don't say to them, hey, I need you to bring firewood to the house. I'll say, hey, I need you to fire up the lawn tractor. So they don't mind that. And then bring some firewood to the house. So no problem. Now, is it always friendly? I think you want to keep it friendly as much as possible. But I don't think you're ever going to have it be totally friendly. Uh, now, raising kids... You have to teach them how to do things. They have to be responsible for things. My kids go out in the morning. They actually enjoy feeding the calves. Um, so I, I could bear down on them about the condition of their rooms and making their beds and all that stuff. But I, I think I would rather have them be outside with the animals and paying attention to the details of that. Now, today, for instance, you know, I've done this job enough times, plus my military experience, when you have a young guy come in and you start questioning him about what he's done. Whenever you get that look, like, ah, uh, I don't know if I'm coming across, but they're like, ah, uh, yeah, you know, and like, to water the calves. Technically, yes, I did. So sometimes you have to drill down on that. You have to find out exactly. And, and then there's another technique that has worked, served me really well. You just make sure that the kids know that my walk around at night is about 10 o'clock at night. And I may have to wake you up if the calves don't have water. And you do that a couple times. I only had to do it with my older kids, and they just retell the stories. And my younger kids are afraid of that. Okay. Okay, this is Tyler. I have large blacks. Are there advantages of mangas over large blacks? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Large blacks are garbage compared to mangalitsa. Absolutely. Yeah. I wouldn't touch those things. No, just kidding. Um, I actually did cross in large blacks with my mangalitsas. Because a large black has a really nice long back on him. And they're a heritage breed as well. Um, and then if you decide, you know, that's a whole breeding protocol. Um, like you could, you could get a mangalitsa and breed it into your large blacks. And then you would get that really nice back fat. But if you do, weren't into that back fat, then you might not want to do that. Um, large blacks seem to be very hardy. I have them. So they're a great pig. They're just not as great as Mangalitsa. I'm sorry. No, I'm just kidding you. They're a good. They're a good pig. I mean, it, it just depends what you want, you know. Um, I've done well with the Mangalitsas. I like the way they look. I, I like their temperament, but I do have large blacks here, and I like them too. So, okay, here's one from Tim. From Fredericksburg, Virginia, what breed would you start with if you never raise pigs? Well, I could kind of kid you a little bit here and say, oh, Mangalitsa for sure. 
but you might spend a lot of time chasing them down. I mean, finding them where you live. So if you never raised pigs before, I would say whatever you can get your hands on would be a good idea. Uh, I know that the heritage breeds are better and the heritage breeds being this one of 26, you can check that out on your own time. Um, the, the white pigs, they're a cross between a York and a land race and they come out of the um, industrial farming complex. Uh, they don't do well on forage. Uh, they're kind of a high-speed animal, and they got to have hog chow all the time. And I'll just, I'm just going to throw it out there right now. Hog chow is not your friend when you're feeding pigs. So you want a pig that doesn't need hog chow. Hog chow, when you feed it to them, they stink. And there's lots of things in that hog chow um, that are not friendly to you. So you, you can take the advice of the feed guy at the, the grain company that you do business with, and he will always tell you use hog chow because that's what they teach him in school. But it's not good, and I don't recommend it at all. Every time that we've had any exposure to it, it's caused us problems. It br actually brings things on the farm, health things that you don't want, and you don't want that smell. Uh, we've... We have a closed herd now, and what that means is I don't bring anything in from outside uh, on a regular basis. If I ever did, it would be like maybe one breeding stock, like one boar. Last time I did that was a long time ago. And now we line breed, so um, I got everything I need right here. And I'm doing heritage pigs anyway. If you get close... You know, like if you you don't want to breed litter mates, but if it were to happen, they're more like a pig that would be out in the wild. You know, like a, a Eurasian wild boar from the Pacific Rim. Those pigs, and even feral pigs that are down in the southern part of the United States, those pigs, litter mates will breed, and uh, there aren't any problems. Some people say, well, they start getting small and things like that, but I don't, I don't think that's true. I think it's just that. Uh, for survivability um, and the lack of just concentrated feed that's handed to them by man, um, they're more athletic and they're, they stay a little bit more trim. So if you never raise pigs, I would say get what you can. Um, get feeder pigs. Like don't start with breeding stock right off the bat. Just get maybe two pigs, two males or two females, raise them up. Get them off to slaughter, however you're going to do that. I rec Actually, I recommend that you sharpen your skills and learn how to do that on your own. The same as you would a, a deer or something else that you would harvest from, say, the woods. You should be able to uh, harvest your own pigs, your own sheep, your own goats, all that stuff. It's, it is not brain surgery. It is not easy. But uh, there are situations that you wind up in where you might have to, you know, eat your dog. And you would learn if you had to. So you might as well, um, you might as well learn that now while, um, you know, <laughs> you're not in a tough situation where you have to eat your dog. <clears throat> okay, I'm out of questions. Can you believe that? No more questions. Do you have a question for me? Okay, well, I have uh, a question that I'd like to answer. I don't have it written down, but I've, I've gotten this question before, and I would like to explain this. Um, this uh, live chat falls under the Baker's Green Acres Anyone Can Farm program. All right, so Baker's Green Acres is our website, and that's where we, you know, put my wife's blogs up on and all the videos that I make and stuff like that. It's all there. Baker's comp. Well, if you go there, you'll see a tab that says anyone can farm. And that is the facet of our operation where we um, feel as though we need to pass this. This is where we show farming is we want you to feed your family and your friends, you know, you're not going to 
you're not going to hurt my market because my market's my family. I have them and my friends are my friends. And if they want to go to you, that's okay because I can just raise a little less or eat a little more, you know. In commercial farming, you kind of protect the seats that you that This is not that. I want you to learn everything that I know. I want to, when I first got into this, I would ask a question and the answers that would come back were like, what? You know, I had no, I had no idea what the answers were going to come back at me. So I couldn't even decipher them. It takes time. And that's what this, this fellowship of people is about. Um, you, you have a place where you can go and ask a question now and again. Hopefully we can develop this to the point where if you have somebody that also lives in Virginia, you know, maybe they live near you, you could, you could hook up somehow, or, you know, this guy could get large blacks and you could get pangolitas because we have that going in Michigan. There's a bunch of us that help each other out with feed and labor and things like that. So, um, that tab is the anyone can farm tab. Now the question is like, what's with this anyone can farm come from? I got to take you way back, 10 years back. I would have people show up here unannounced with a million questions and I was very busy and, uh, I, I like people, so I, a lot of times I would break off from what I was doing. And then when I got back to it, I would say to myself, I got to quit doing that, you know, because I got to get my work done. <clears throat> Make no mistake, this is hard. It's hard work. And so I kind of threw it out there that I wonder if there's a way that we could prevent that from happening if we just put information out there that people could just get and this is this is 10 years ago so i you know, i don't know if we even had youtube 10 years ago i know we didn't have facebook um internet really wasn't part of my life except for reading the news you know um so we were at a campfire and somebody had the idea of this training program where we could people have people come in residence onto the farm and we could show them how to butcher a pig we could have them come we could show them how charge for it so it'd be a source of income for the farm the problem with that is information age that we're in now where everybody's got a phone in their pocket but nobody answers the phone All right so how can you get people to come to your house to learn something on a saturday or a sunday they're busy everybody's busy so that's where this comes in. You may be busy, but you can cut out for an hour and watch, you know, a presentation like this. So anyway, we're trying to figure out a name for it. And the name Anyone Can Farm was taken from that movie Ratatouille, where, if you remember, there was a little rat that wound up being... You know a very good chef and there was this little chef that wanted to be a great chef but he was actually a little twerp and uh, we sort of have the same situation now we have you know like professional people out there that will tell you how to farm but they really are trying to push in the direction of industrial ag or nothing. And so um, we want this to be like, remember on Ratatouille, the, the big fat guy that you only saw his spirit, and he said, anyone can cook. Anyone can cook. Well, it's in the same spirit. Anyone can farm. Now, f farming is the raising of or the creation of proteins and... Uh, and carbohydrates and then taking those proteins and carbohydrates and adding value to them you know bacon doesn't grow on trees it's from a pig but you have to kill the pig you have to get the bacon off you have to cure the bacon you have to hang the bacon you have to slice the bacon all that stuff and then you have to cook it all right so there's a process 
So it's not just the creation of this, these products, this uh, protein and carbohydrates. It's the process of adding value to it to the point where it's a product that you can utilize. So that's why anyone can farm. That's where anyone can farm came from. And, you know, how do we define farming? I think we define farming here as um, if you're growing any carbohydrates or you're growing any, it, it, it doesn't have anything to do with how much land you have. My father used to grow tomatoes in five gallon buckets when he moved off from my, my mother and father's house to a condominium and he still wanted to do that stuff. So he raised tomatoes there. He was still farming. He was still farming. Okay, I got a bunch of questions here. Okay. Here's a Ryan's question. Okay, Ryan's from Texas, South Texas, down there by the border. Hey, uh, no, never mind. At what point would it be worth it to borrow or buy a tractor with a front end loader? Trying to do all with cash but tractor holds value used or new what ryan says build the wall <laughs> we're going to stay away from anything like that on here <laughs> anything like that all right ryan tractor that's that's a, an awesome question because all right maybe you don't have enough work for that tractor now Right, But if you have a tractor, I guarantee you, you will take on things that you wouldn't before. Because like, let's say you scrounge some big chunk of something from somebody and you can get it home. They can load it and you can get it home, but you can't get it out off your trailer or your, your pickup or whatever. But if you have a tractor with a loader on it and the loader is that, that bucket that lifts up and lifts down. And I have one of those. And for a long time, I didn't. And I tried all kinds of things. But if you have a loader, um, you're gonna find other jobs that you can do. And you can you can do so much work with a loader. Like if you, if you get a loader, I can give you five things that you can get into that I wouldn't recommend that you get into if you didn't have a loader. All right. So, I mean, I don't believe in new. We have very few pieces of equipment on this place that we've purchased new. Very, very few. And the only reason was because we couldn't find them used. And so we'll buy them new. But the minute that tractor rolls out of a, a dealership, it loses money. And it, it, it loses money to a point and then it holds it there for quite a long time. Uh, when I bought my tractor, I paid 10,000 for it, 13,000 for it. Yeah. And that was 14 years ago, but it hasn't lost any value. As a matter of fact, if we hadn't smashed it up, it would probably be worth more, but we did smash it up a little bit. If you buy something used and then you have a shop that you can pull it in, <clears throat> Usually a farmer has something and they beat it up a little bit and it devalues it. So if you pull it in and then you go to work on it, paint it up a little bit, fix some things on it, put some lights on it, then you'll have a, you know, you can, you can buy something that was a liability to somebody and turn it into an asset for you. And then you can add value to it as well. And uh, there's no reason why the average homesteader person like me can't, mechanic on stuff, can't paint, can't get on YouTube and find out how to change an alternator. You know, it's all very durable, durable equipment. And uh, I would say if it was a choice between going on a trip to Tahiti and buying a tractor, I'd buy the tractor. But that's just me. Because I've been around the world. I don't think much of Tahiti anyway. Yeah, get a tractor. It's a good idea. And get one with a loader. Um, you didn't ask me about four-wheel drive, so I won't say anything. I won't say anything. 
I'm just going to answer what I'm asked. Okay. This is from Home Place Journal. They don't say where they are. Would it be worthwhile to rent a trailer for a specific job if I don't have to buy? Have money to buy. If you don't have money to buy? Well, if you don't have money to buy and you got to get something done, I would rent the trailer. Um, but sort of like with a loader, if you have a trailer, then the next thing that comes along for you to scrounge, somebody wants to give you something or you need to pick something up, then you have a piece of equipment that you can, you can haul it with. And that was from Boise, Idaho, Home Place Journal. That sounds neat, Home Place Journal. Sound like a, a blogger. From Boise, Idaho. Um, I have, let's see, one, two, three, four. I have five trailers here. Five trailers. And one's a livestock trailer. It's for hauling cattle. Uh, another one is kind of an over-the-road trailer, and it's for hauling... I haul pigs with that, and I can. It's a bumper hitch. My my cattle one is uh, a, what's called a gooseneck, so there's a ball in the center of a pickup bed, and you can haul heavy loads with that. Oh, you said tractor. <laughs> All right, tractor. Um, should you rent one? in lieu of buying one if you don't have the money yeah. well i yeah i mean it depends what you're going to do with it are you going to do you know just are you just going to do like a few chores with it or are you going to make a it depends what you're going to do really um if you're gonna why don't you tell jill what you're going to do with it so i can get a little bit more specific i'm going to try and not go into what what I think too much. I want to answer your question. Um, but about my trailers, I have this really neat little trailer that will go behind our minivan. I have a, a Toyota minivan that I really like. And uh, this little trailer, it's just, I don't know, it's like six by five, I guess, or seven by five. And it's got big wheels on it, and it, I can put just about anything on it. I can carry a refrigerator on it if I need to. And if I need to go someplace and pick something up, I can take this really economical little minivan and uh, bring something back, you know, pretty heavy load. And I really like that. So I, I'm a big trailer guy. I would rather see you get into trailers than, say, um, a big truck, you know, like if you had to haul... Uh, leaves or something. I'd rather see you do it with a trailer than a truck because there's no registration on that. If you get a permanent plate, you can kind of move that plate around from trailer to trailer, I suppose. But with a tractor, um, yeah, yeah, I, now that I think of it, that's okay. Um, a lot of times guys will rent a backhoe for the weekend if they have a specific job that they want to knock out. And uh, yeah, you can you can probably you should probably do that, but I'd I'd like to know what you're planning to do with a tractor. You know, oh, oh, okay. You got a specific plan. You're gonna do some clearing and prepping for a building, a barn, and a workshop. Yeah, yeah. I guess I would. Um, you know, there's another route you can go uh, if you're not proficient at operating that equipment. You can make one heck of a mess, uh, or you could hire somebody because generally you can get those guys, you know, with a backhoe and a front end loader on it, and you can get them for 150 to 200 bucks an hour. And a guy that does that for a living, they can move a lot of stuff in that amount of time. So that might be a better way to go if you guys got in there and did the chainsaw work and let a professional, you know, earth mover come in and do that i mean it's just a thought it's just a thought um i've had work done here 
that uh, was too much for my little tractor. So I hired a man that had a, um, an oh, excavator to come in and dig. This journal is really good, actually good with heavy equipment. Oh, if you're good with heavy equipment, then then maybe you could save yourself some money. So I guess that's going to have to be a, a call on your part. I couldn't, I, I'll tell you what I think, but. Uh, okay. I got another question I'll read to you. She's got another question for me. Okay, this is from Tim Milano in Michigan DUP. This is from um, Tim Milano in Michigan, in the upper peninsula, peninsula of Michigan. Um, how do you feel about getting involved with local programs that help pay for things like hoop houses, cover crops, and such? For example, MSU Extension has an ag and forestry department that will send someone out, help you to fill out applications for government money to help purchase some of these things. Am I inviting Big Brother if I get involved? All right. This is, uh, Tim is asking how I feel about getting involved with government programs where they they come out and they uh, do an assessment of your property and then they they give you money to build hoop houses and and things like this um, and he wants to know if he's inviting Big Brother into his into his world um, You know, they, they have those programs and they are dead set on giving that money out to people to do things with it. And so I think Tim's thinking about building a, a hoop house. Um, I know people that have done it and then the hoop house winds up sitting. And they don't do anything with it because it's not as easy as you think um, to run a greenhouse. There's a lot to that. It takes a lot of dedication, a lot of training, and uh, I don't, I don't really know one way or the other whether, whether you're inviting a bad element onto your place um, or not, because I'm not really sure who's given that money out. I think uh, probably one of the principles of of homesteading and probably the way that I would like to go from here on out is self-reliance and uh, you know the government doesn't produce anything but they do take money from these people and redistribute it to these people so that money that they're going to give you to build that hoop house that's somebody else's money if you don't take it somebody else will I get that. I get that. Um, that program is available to me. I'll just tell you that. And I haven't taken advantage of it. I haven't. So that's best I can do for you, Tim. All right. This is Tammy from northern Minnesota. Way up there in Minnesota. That's what it's all about in Minnesota. I have a nursery cow, a nursing cow, and would like to raise out a couple of steers on her. Is that what she's saying? Yeah. Would it be better to raise them on her or bottle feed? Are you milking her? Are you milking her for your house? Um, because I can tell you this is what we do. When one of our cows will freshen, they're going to put out way more milk than we need. So about that time, uh, we will let the calf that she's just dropped have the milk during the day, and we'll milk her at night. Or we'll let the calf have it at night, and we'll milk her during the day. So we share with the calf. Um, but then when it comes time to wean her, wean the calf off, we still might have too much milk, as we usually wean the calf off at six weeks show eight six or eight weeks and we still might have too much milk so then we wind up uh, giving that milk to 
other calves that we bring on. My wife works at a dairy and they produce a ton of calves and calves are not worth very much now. They're not worth much at all or nothing. And so you can get them very cheap and they do require milk for the first eight weeks. So uh, I would say take what you need from her because that milk is very important, a very important commodity for the homestead. Um, it's one of the best things that we do is milk a cow. I mean, that cow turns, you know, the grass that's in areas where I can't mow, don't want to mow, don't want to take care of, she'll turn that into very high quality milk, which we can turn into really high quality cheese, really high quality butter. My wife is making ghee now, really good stuff. You can make ice cream with it, uh, all kinds of stuff. So I, I think I would take what I wanted in milk first and then give them. And, you know, you can water it down so they have more. Um, you can also buy calf replacer. It's this, re it's, I'm sure you've seen it. It's, uh, it looks like uh, that non-dairy creamer that you put in your coffee sometimes. Um, and you mix it with hot water and it makes this kind of gross tasting milk but the calves like it and then you can augment you know the milk that you have with that uh, that stuff's expensive so but I would rather feed natural milk in lieu of the uh, calf replacer and bottle feedings a lot of fun isn't it that's something that's really good for your children to do feeding bottles to calves. Okay, this is Carrie. She doesn't say where she's from. Is it a good idea to milk a Jersey cow once a day? Laugh. Well, I have a Jersey cow and I make lots of videos about her and I milk her once a day. And it's a good idea for me. I mean, I guess if I wanted to push her to her maximum, and that would be something I would do if I was commercial farming. I'd want to get every ounce of milk I could out of that cow, no matter what. Well, I don't really need that much. I mean, if I get, right now I'm getting about a gallon and a half a day. That's, you know, it's almost eight gallons of milk a week. Even with all my kids and everything that we do. And we have one friend that has a, a son that needs, he's got some health issues and he's got to have raw milk. Um, we still have more milk than we need. So some people will will discourage you from mil milking once a day because they'll say, oh, you know, her production is going to drop off. But <clears throat> how much milk do you really need? And how long would you like her to last? You know, we don't want to use her up. A cow could be with you for 15 years. And she could be faithfully giving you a calf and milk every single year of her life. And, like, I love my cow. Okay, I don't understand this. Okay, Tammy responded to yours, and that ties into your last answer. Her cow is in milk with no calf and way too much milk for their small family. Oh, Tammy, you're getting too much milk. Well, <laughs> there's so many things that you can do with that milk. Um, we just bought a cream separator, paid $250 for it. it was, it's a brand new deal, but it's uh, Scandinavian. And now we can, we can take the cream off the milk. So then just the, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it skim milk. It's still whole milk that comes in the house. Is that skim milk? If you take... If, if you take the cream off yeah. of it, okay. It still looks like regular milk. Um, so then we have cream. We can take that cream and put it in the churn. And we have this churn that uh, it. we bought that brand new too many years ago. What would you pay for that? I don't remember. I don't remember. But less, less than $200, probably $100. It's a big jar that's got a motor on top of it and then a paddle that's down into the jar and it, you plug it in and it goes by itself. Um, so you can make butter. The butter you could put in 
uh, tubs and you could freeze it. And so you'd have butter forever, you know. Um, you can make cheese with it, so you'd have to get some books and stuff and read up on that or wait until we put out a comprehensive video on making cheese. That'll be in a while, but we want to get around to doing those things. Um, you can always feed it to pigs. You know, you could take grain and you could soak the grain in it, you know, to stabilize it until you're ready to give it to them. I've actually, uh, um, soaked bread with milk just because I didn't want to waste it. Uh, sometimes if we have milk around a little too long, it might curdle up a little bit and, you know, I can give that to the pigs or you can give it to chickens too. Chickens are omnivores and they'll eat all that stuff. Very good for them. Okay. Okay. It's getting close to wrap up time. Okay. We said we wanted to go an hour and we started a little bit late, but I'm going to do this faithfully every Wednesday night and at seven o'clock. And um, I'm going to try and keep correct here of who's who and where they're coming from and glean from this information uh, direction that we need to go with the um, Homesteaders Guild. And if you don't know about the Homesteaders Guild, I think if you know about this, you should, but the Homesteaders Guild is a program that started on Thursday. So this is actually starting tomorrow, the winter session starting tomorrow, and you could still get in on it very easy. Um, I'll put a video out, and it's not too long. I'll try to keep it about 20 minutes, and it's of a subject that I think is pertinent to the season that we're in and what you should be doing to get ready for the season that's coming. Farming is always about looking into the future and getting done today what you're going to want to be doing in the future. So um, I put a video out on Thursday try to do it before noon and then you have until next Tuesday to look at it and maybe hit some of the research material get some of the parts just let it marinate in your brain and then Tuesday night we get together on what's called a zoom call and it varies from this in that the screen will have all these little blocks on it and each one will have a face on it and so and one of the blocks is my face and so it's like a classroom setting and i i thought it was pretty dopey at first but actually it works out pretty good because i can come in sit down boom we're in class and we can go for an hour and it's the information we talk about is a, about what that video is about and what i try to do is weave um a guide all right, so homesteading is sort of like deer hunting. You know, I can, I can show you how to shoot a gun. I can teach you some of the basics, but really I can guide you. That's about it. You, it has to get in you, and you have to start thinking about it all the time. And that will happen. It just takes time, and it takes to have a group, or whether you know it or not, whenever you do something in a group of people, who also want to go that direction is a, uh, a symbi symbiosis that happens and it's real is that the word I'm looking for yeah and it's real and uh, you come away from it with sort of a, a secret sauce you know you, you, you have this you have this uh, power that you come away from it to forage on and the other people in the group bring other points of view, other questions about it that I didn't think of, you know. So it was it's sort of like guiding people on a hunt. They're going to ask you questions that you might have never thought about filling them in on before they ask you the questions. So that's that's what this is. We're we're guiding. This is a guide service. Um, anybody who is a guide probably learned from a father or a grandfather or a mother or something like that. And then they did it for themselves for a while. And they got to the point where they 
something just clicks in your brain like I need to teach this I need to show people how to do this so that's kind of where we're at and proud to do it proud to do it glad to do it so if you uh, are interested in the Homesteaders Guild you can get a hold of us through the website um, there's still time to get in on that that's a paid deal this is a free one this one is all your questions that is is my agenda that we work in the Homesteaders Guild and uh, once that is done <laughs> once it's done once the 12 weeks are done it's packaged and then those packages can also be acquired they can be sold at far less than if you were in the in the guild but once you're in the guild you're in it forever uh, if you let's say you did the fall guild but you didn't want to pay for the winter one you would still get the videos but you don't get to participate in the class you could still watch them. okay so this is mark from baker's green acres remember anyone can farm see you next week end stream